our speaker today is certainly no exception as a powerful advocate. And he certainly has the credentials, graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1964, served as president of the American Holistic Medical Association, president of the American Academy for Advancement in Medicine, and president of the Smith County Medical Society in Virginia. He practices medicine at the Mount Rainier Clinic in Yelm, Washington, and he's been board certified in both family practice and chelation therapy. He was chief of staff of a U.S. public health service hospital and served for many years as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Holistic Medicine and the Journal of Advancement in Medicine. He has authored numerous books and scientific articles in the field of nutrition, preventive medicine, and anti-aging. And in fact, we do have uh, uh, Bypassing Bypass, uh, which uh, uh, is perhaps one of the main books that has introduced many people up here in, into chelation therapy. Uh, he has uh, many past memberships, offices and affiliations, uh, uh, chief of staff as the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in Tallahina, Tal 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 pardon me, Oklahoma, from 75 to 76, president of Smith County, or Smythe County because it's spelled with a Y, Medical Society in Virginia in 1980, diplomat of the American Board of Family Practice in 1974 and recertified in 1985, diplomat of the American Board of Chelation Therapy 1984, recertified in 1990 and 1998, president of the American College for Advancement in Medicine from 1991 to 1992, president of the American Holistic Medical Association 1980 to 1981, fellow of the International College of Applied Nutrition since 1975, Editor-in-Chief, the Journal of Holistic Medicine from 81 to 1986. Editor-in-Chief, Journal of Advancement in Medicine from 1986 to 1989. Fellow founding, or pardon me, founding fellow of the American College for Advancement in Medicine. Charter Fellow, American Academy of Family Physicians. Licensed to practice medicine in Washington and Virginia. His current membership is in the American Academy of Family Physicians, Washington Academy of Family Physicians, American College for Advancement in Medicine, American Preventive Medical Association, and the Chinese Health Care Association on Aging. And my goodness, uh, this goes on. I mean, the gentleman was born in 1932, in September 17th. He's a young man. And he's got all these achievements. And uh, he graduated from Groveland High School in Groveland, Massachusetts. Uh, in 1950, Capital Radio, Radio Engineering Institute in Washington, D.C., United States Navy Electronics Technician, uh, United States Navy Flight uh, Training, and these were in the 1950s, U.S. Naval Aviator, Aircraft Carrier Pilot, Jet Fighter Pilot, so a lot of accomplishments here. I think we're... Don't do all of that. You know, but anyway, so we better leave it at that. I am very pleased and I'm to welcome, and I'm certainly uh, asking you to join me in welcoming Dr. Elmer Cranton. <laughs> Dr. Cranton. Thank you very much. I didn't realize it had been so long since I was here before, in, in the late 80s, I guess. I thought it was just four or five years ago, but time does fly, especially when you're busy. A rebuttal to four or five studies, publications in mainstream medical journals which allege to discredit and disprove chelation therapy. Many of you here are familiar with those. One study was done in Denmark, one was done in New Zealand. Uh, there were two publications on the Danish study in two different journals. Uh, one was uh, done in the United States back in 1963, and another was unpublished, done in Heidelberg, Germany. The four publications, because they are in mainstream journals and because they're indexed in the Medline computerized database and the Index Medicus, are available to any physician who wants to research on his computer or through the medical library who wants to research chelation. And those articles will come up and they all have a negative conclusion when in fact they're positive studies. They actually have positive data and are statistically significant as proving benefit from EDTA. They're very misleading, they're very deceptive. Uh, why they were ever published, uh, we can only speculate, but uh, it's enough to make one believe in conspiracy. In any case, <laughs> in any case, if you, if you mention chelation to most physicians in practice, cardiologists, bypass surgeons, family doctors, 
whoever, nine times out of ten, or perhaps more often, they will say, no, it doesn't work, it's quackery, it's been disproven. The studies have been published, double-blind control studies have been published to prove that it does not work. Well, I just want to briefly go through those studies. You have to realize that only 10% of the world's biomedical literature actually ends up indexed in the Medline computerized database, the National Library of Medicine in the United States, which is the main source of uh, research, uh, literature research for most physicians and medical scientists. Uh, about 90% is excluded for one reason or another. Every positive study with a positive conclusion on chelation therapy, except one, was censored out of that database. It was refused public, the journals which were, which published the articles were refused indexing. So if a physician is interested and does a computerized search, they do not find these articles. I've also today, and in my slides when I present them, given you a summary of the positive articles. Very good, very good positive research data. But they don't come up in the, in the computerized search or the, or the medical library search. The four articles that I'll talk about today do come up. They all have negative conclusions. Most physicians, when they research, a, a read an article, will not take the hour or two it takes to to analyze for themselves all of the raw data as it appears, or the actual data as it appears in the article. They'll go to the summary and the conclusion and look at the statistics and they'll take that for granted and just assume that the article, that the data in the article supports that conclusion because it is in a peer-reviewed journal where the reviewers supposedly assure the reader that that is the case. That is not the case because the, the journals and the reviewers were biased against chelation. I'll start with a, uh, with a 1963, I don't have any slides for this first part, but you have this titled, Chelation Critics Publish Deceptive Data. It's 10 pages, it will be a chapter in, in the upcoming uh, revised edition of Bypassing Bypass. You've got it here, every word, and you're welcome to make as many copies as you want. I would recommend that you give a copy of this to any doctor who says that the studies prove chelation doesn't work. Ask him to read it and then talk to you because they prove just the opposite. They show just the opposite. <clears throat> the first article was an old one. is 1963 by a Dr. Kitchell and Meltzer and several other associates. It was published in a, in a mainstream journal in the uh, American Journal of Cardiology. They said that chel the conclusion said EDTA chelation therapy for the treatment of atherosclerosis does not work because some of the patients got worse after therapy was discontinued. In other words, it didn't last forever. They didn't live forever. Therefore, it's no good. Now, there is no therapy in medicine that you could not make the same statement about. It doesn't work forever. The patients that were selected for this study, I'll read you the, the, what the authors themselves say about the patients. We selected patients referred because of severe angina, severe heart disease. The patients had previously been treated with most of the accepted methods, and their inclusion in this study resulted from wholly unsuccessful courses. In other words, nothing else had helped. They were all disabled at the time therapy began. Despite that fact, basically what, what they showed was that 71% of patients had subjective improvement of symptoms, 64% had objective measured improvement in exercise tolerance, uh, electrocardiograms, treadmill testing, and so forth. And this, <clears throat> this improvement was maintained for at least a year and a half after therapy was discontinued in over half the patients. Despite all of those good, positive things they had to say in the body of the article, the conclusion was that because after a year and a half or two years without treatment, the patients started to get worse again. This was also at a time when nutritional supplements were not given, patients were not replenished with the essential trace elements which chelation can, EDTA can remove uh, and cause deficiencies if they're not given by mouth. 
Uh, no attention was paid to smoking or nutritional factors or dietary factors. Despite all that, we still had these, these good positive results. Despite the good positive results, the authors say, doesn't work. Now, the next study that I'll talk about had two publications. It was published in the American Journal of Surgery and in the Journal of Internal Medicine, two mainstream indexed, readily available to any physician looking it up in a computerized database, both saying that this double-blind controlled study showed that EDTA chelation therapy did not work. Now, here's what they did. They were measuring, uh, first of all, this study and the New Zealand study were done by bypass surgeons, who we all know have reason to be biased. They had no experience with EDTA chelation therapy before they did the study. They did not follow the currently administered protocol by uh, a thousand or more chelation doctors in the states and around the world. And they misrepresented their data badly. First of all, they said this was a double blind study. It was not. That was a, that was a total untruth. Uh, the surgeons knew who got the treatment and who did not get the treatment, who got the placebo and who got the EDTA before they made their final measurements of improvement. So that was a serious mis misrepresentation. The study therefore suffers with the same flaw that mainstream physicians use to criticize the positive studies of EDTA. They say the studies were not double-blind control studies. This study was not a double-blind study, it was not a double-blind placebo control study, but it was published as a double-blind placebo control study. The surgeons who did the study admit now that they knew who got the, who got the EDTA and who did not, and more than half the patients knew. Now, I won't go into all these details <clears throat> because we don't have time, but I'll just say that the two groups, the group that got the EDTA had at least, had, had much, had significantly more severe disease than the group that got placebo before they started. They were not matched groups. The two groups were not matched and the, the group that got EDTA was much more seriously affected than the group that got placebo. This is using their own data. Uh, patients dropped out. They were not accounted for in the data. Why did they drop out? That was never explained. The researchers refused access to the data. They would not uh, allow, they still will not allow us or anyone else to see their raw data or to see what happened to these patients that dropped out. And it's quite possible that some dropped out because they got better. If they got better and their symptoms got better, why would they come back? Why wasn't that explained? Why didn't they at least say why? Why, went, why, why was no attempt made to, to track the patient down and get some kind of a reason? Then when they did the walking distance measurement three months after treatment, when we get the maximum benefit, some of these patients stopped for reasons other than pain. They were excluded from the study. Now, patients that got better would not have pain. Their claudication would be better. If their claudication got totally well and they did not stop, if they just stopped because they got tired or got out of breath and the, and the original symptom that was treated was not what stopped them, they were excluded from the study. Therefore, the patients that got EDTA who had the most benefit were just dropped. And because we don't have access to the raw data, because we're, we are refused access actually, there's no way we can go back and track that down. Uh, iron, it's well known. Iron nutritional supplementation with iron will neutralize EDTA. All of these people were given iron every day during the study. The bottom line was that the EDTA treated group demonstrated twice as much improvement as the placebo treated group, even with all these weaknesses. Why would that be? The next study.